This episode is brought to you by my friends at Patreon. If you'd like to join them and get early audios of upcoming episodes, please see the link in the description. Hi, fellow seekers. You'll never guess what just happened. Right after I published my video on how the moon's lower gravity would require a different measurement of time, a group of physicists at the National Institute of Standards and Technology announced they'd done the same for Mars. Don't really need to go through the whole story again, except to say that clocks on Mars, depending on the time of the Martian year, will tick 477 microseconds a day faster than on Earth. But in the process of learning this, I went down a rather substantial rabbit hole. Timekeeping on Mars is a far more established, complex, and storied activity than timekeeping on the Moon. And we've been doing it for longer than you might think. Mars is a weird planet, and its weirdness is in its familiarity. I mean, yes, it's basically dreary Arizona, but that's to be expected from the lack of water. I mean that it's familiar in ways that it has no reason to be. Mars's synodic rotation period, what boring people call its day, is 24 hours, 39 minutes, and 36 seconds, which, if you do the math, is just two and two-thirds percent longer than Earth's. Its axial tilt, which is what gives a planet its seasons, is 25.19 degrees, just 7.2% higher than Earth's. This is, as far as anyone can tell, complete coincidence. Earth, due to its gigantic, gravitationally yanking moon, has had far shorter days in the past, and will have longer days in the future. While Mars, due to its lack of a gigantic, gravitationally yanking moon, has seen its axial tilt vary by as much as 120 degrees. It's just one of those maddening alignments, like total solar eclipses and Bode's Law, that seemingly exist to test how far they can push astronomers until they believe in astrology. Thus, if one were to stand on the surface of Mars, one would experience a day and night cycle remarkably like that on Earth, even over the course of the year. You'd think that would make timekeeping on Mars easy. And in some respects, you'd be right. After decades of Mars exploration, directors of various landers, pilots of various rovers, and testers of the first Mars flyer have devised a standard timekeeping system that closely mirrors our own. The Martian day, concisely if somewhat annoyingly called a sol, is divided into 24 Martian hours, then 60 Martian minutes, and 60 Martian seconds each two and two-thirds percent longer than those on our world. Of course, to have a day, you need a prime meridian. And you'd be pleased to know that Mars has one. In fact, it's had one for longer than its sister planet, Earth. Mars's prime meridian was established in the 1830s, 50 years before us squabbling Earthlings settled on Greenwich. Initially, the astronomer team Wilhelm Beer and Johann Heinrich von Madler, in need of a prime meridian, settled on this albedo feature. If you can't see it, it's the one that looks a bit like a pancreas. But it was Giovanni Schiaparelli, whose maps would go on to establish the myth of Mars for the modern age, who set it in stone. Sometime in the 1870s, popular science writer Camille Flammarion would christen that area Sinus Meridiani, or Meridian Bay. It is still called Meridiani Planum today. But precision was required, and so, first a specific crater, named Airy after George Biddle Airy, the constructor of the Circle Transit Telescope at Greenwich, that is the traditional location of the prime meridian, and then Airy Zero, a crater within said crater. But because nothing can ever be simple, the IAU decided to go for even more precision by declaring the prime meridian as 47.95137 degrees west of the Viking lander. Martian explorers even employed their own calendar, its year one beginning on the 11th of April 1955 and ending on the 25th of February 1957, the year a great dust storm was observed on Mars. 
Note that Mars Year One does not commemorate any particular human achievement as regards Mars. The first Mars flyby did not occur until Mars Year Six. Today, we are in Mars Year 38. I have not been able to determine if the Mars Year calendar comprises 687 Earth days or 686.98 Earth days, the precise length of the Martian year. If they do employ the less accurate figure, then they'll need to subtract an Earth day by Mars Year 50, or 23 Earth years from now. Oh, and before anyone asks, in 2014, Mars Year Zero was added to the count, to ensure we don't make the same stupid mistake we made last time. To be clear, the Martian year is nothing like its comely neighbors. For one thing, Jupiter has tugged Mars into a highly elliptical orbit, the most for any planet save Mercury. Over the course of its year, its distance from the Sun varies by as much as 40 million kilometers, or a quarter Earth's orbital distance. So unlike on Earth, where seasons are dictated almost entirely by axial tilt, Mars's seasons are equally, if not more affected, by its distance from the Sun. On Earth, the seasons are all roughly the same length. But on Mars, because varying distance also varies its orbital speed, the season's lengths vary widely. For the Northern Hemisphere, spring lasts seven months, summer six months, autumn five months, and winter four months. For the Southern Hemisphere, those numbers are reversed, which means it experiences six months of winter and just four months of summer. Also, because it faces the sun at perihelion and away from the sun at aphelion, the Southern Hemisphere has far more severe seasons than the Northern. Most of Mars's significant dust storms are triggered during the Southern Hemisphere summer, when the sun pumps the most energy into the system. At that time, the temperature can get as high as a blistering 20 Celsius. Mars's two tiny moons, Deimos and Phobos, circle their planet in hours rather than days, and thus nature offers no convenient way by which to divide the year. Mars explorers use a very scientific alternative called solar longitude, or L sub S. They divide the Martian year into four segments, determined not as you would think, by the sun's position in the sky as it passes over the Martian surface, like every other calendar that has ever existed, but from the angle between Mars and the sun in its orbit. So the northern spring equinox, the start of the Martian year calendar, is zero degrees. The summer solstice is 90 degrees. The autumnal equinox is 180 degrees. And the winter solstice is 270 degrees. I suppose this makes sense when dealing with Mars from Earth, but I imagine anyone on Mars might find it a bit esoteric. Thankfully, there's been an attempt to remedy the problem. It's called the Darien Calendar, and it was invented in 1986 by Thomas Gangale, a space lawyer and author of optimistically titled books like The Development of Outer Space, Sovereignty and Property Rights in International Space Law, and Globalization of Space. The Astro-Sociological Approach. But that is not what he's famous for. In 1985, Gangel conceived of a calendar for the use of a future Martian colony. Naming it the Darien Calendar after his son Darius, he essentially condensed a thousand years of calendar reform into one project. And I'm very glad he did, because Martian calendrics are enough to drive any nascent civilization insane. We as a species don't really grasp how lucky we are that our world's annual calendric remainder comprises just under a quarter of a day. It makes things simple. One extra day every four years, three lost days every 400 years. Game, set, match. Until our next bout of evolution, anyway. Mars's tropical year, that is, a year from the perspective of someone looking at the sky from its surface, is 668.5921 Martian days. That 0.5921 is a heck of a nut to crack, and Gangale strikes it like this. Every even-numbered year comprises 668 Martian days. Every odd-numbered year has 669 Martian days. An additional day is also added every 10 years, so that years divisible by 10 
also comprised 669 Martian days. Together, these adjustments create a slight overshot. So every 100 years, the 10-year rule is foregone, and the year returns to 668 days. Every 500 years, the 100-year rule is foregone, and the 500 divisible year, like other decimal years, has 669 days. Got that? No? Well, basically it means that for any native Martians, there would be no distinction between a leap year and a normal year. Even-numbered years are short, odd-numbered years are long. The term leap year could very well be reserved for that decadal adjustment. Because Mars's orbit changes so radically over time, making further adjustments to the calendar is pointless. But how would this divide it up? Well, first off, any Martian calendar must deal with the simple fact that Mars's year is nearly twice as long as Earth's. 1.88 times as long, to be specific. You could divide it into 12 months, but a 60-day month doesn't really fit the human scale of things. Gangale solves this problem fairly simply. 24 months. Each month is therefore 27.858 Martian days long. To get this average, Gangale creates 20 months of 28 Martian days and 4 of 27 Martian days. These four would fall at the end of every quarter, and when the additional day is required, it falls on the last day of the year. The kind of rational, elegant presentation that comes with inventing your calendar from whole cloth. In naming the months, Gangale follows the lead of Mars prophet Robert Zubrin and just uses the constellations there in any specific time. This is a problem, because A, there are only 12 constellations, and B, not all constellations are the same length. But that second bit never bothered astrologers, so never mind. As for there only being 12 constellations, he solves this by doubling them up, first using their Latin names, and then their Sanskrit ones. This seems well-intentioned, but I doubt it would survive on an actual Mars colony, particularly given that, unless India puts some serious Shakti into its space program, our most likely compatriots on Mars are the Chinese, who, at least in their daily life, don't use the same constellations we do. They also don't use the same name for Mars that we do, nor, in fact, does any other non-European culture. Given that, Gangale's decision to start the calendar on the northern spring equinox, just as the ancient Romans did in honor of Mars, hence March, seems a bit culturally chauvinistic. That said, in 2021, a water map of Mars argued that the best place to plonk a colony would be 45 degrees north, in the region of Arcadia Planitia. Northern enough to catch the water, but southern enough not to be frozen solid when the ice caps expand in the winter. It seems that whatever planet you're on, the northern temperate zones always win. Gangale then oversteps his remit a bit by suggesting the weekdays be occasionally edited so that they always fall on the same dates. This seems not only unnecessary, but complicated enough for any Martian colonists to ditch it on day zero. Let them lead their imprecisely aligned lives. Finally, Gangale asks arguably the most fundamental question when to start the calendar. The Mars year wasn't created until the year 2000, but Gangale suggests the Viking landing might be a useful starting point, before admitting it may be too Americocentric. One thing to be said about the Mars year calendar, it doesn't have to mean anything to anyone. We have been dreaming of a life on Mars so intensely for so long, that should it ever happen, we'll have rolled out the carpet for ourselves and set the table. Prospective Martians will buy their clocks and calendars before they leave Earth. That is, if they ever do. I'm not sure if these elaborate plans for timekeeping on Mars are forward planning or wishful thinking. I'm personally of the opinion that there is little we can gain from colonizing Mars that we couldn't gain from the inside of an O'Neill cylinder. At least then we wouldn't need a rocket to get off it.